morning from wherever from wherever you are. Um, before we begin, may I please uh, re request everybody here present to please rename yourselves and include the country where you are from so that we can acknowledge you accordingly. So we will be uh, your MCs for this afternoon. I am Leia, a student at the Loyola School of Theology, and my co-MC will also introduce himself. Hi, good afternoon. I am Maki. I'm also a student at LSD um, and based here in the Philippines. Okay, so we will be uh, leading you through this uh, afternoon. Uh, but before we begin, uh, let me just acknowledge all, some of you who are present here. We are uh, a mix of different people from different countries. We have people from Vietnam, we have from Taiwan, Indonesia. So welcome everybody. Uh, also from the Philippines, uh, tuning in from Manila. We also have someone from Malta. Uh, thank you everyone for being here with us this afternoon. So we're all here gathered for our conversation on Asian theologies and cultures. So for those who are new, uh, I'll just like to give a short background about what this is about. So this is about the theological, cultural, online Asian coffee or tea room where we can converse with each other uh, in one and a half hour monthly or bi-monthly. And this is a virtual space that features students, faculty, or alumni sharing their theological reflections on select aspects of our respective Asian cultures in the Jesuit Conference of South Asia and the Jesuit Conference of the Asia Pacific. So before we begin with the conversations proper, uh, we will just have a short prayer to be led by Brother Andrew Kong. Let us begin our conversation in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Almighty and ever-loving God, we bless and glorify your holy name. You have given us with so abundant blessings, and your presence continuously reminds us of your faithfulness and guidance. Send us your spirit to enlighten our minds as we are going to learn about Jesuit Muslim relations in Indonesia. We humbly ask you to shower our speakers today of your greatest inspiration so that they may share the most of their knowledge, heart, and soul to their respective topic. May we also observe the invaluable knowledge experiences and put it into practice what we may learn today. We also invite our Holy Mother Mary, the seat of wisdom, to be with us in our conversation. We add this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, today, uh, before we go to our speaker's presentation, I'd just like to invite everyone as we move along, if you will have questions or reflections along the way, please feel free to use the chat box, and then we will be queuing them for our uh, discussion later after our speaker's presentation. So today we will be talking about the Jesuit Muslim relations in Indonesia, a paradigm shift to be led by Far Father Haru Prakosa SJ and Siwi Dharma Jati SJ. So just to give you a short background about both of them, uh, Siwi Dharma is a Jesuit, Indonesian Jesuit scholastic and student at the postgraduate program of the theology department of Sanata Dharma University, Yogyakarta. Father Heru, an Indonesian Jesuit priest, has been trained in interreligious and Islamic studies in Lebanon, England, and Italy. Since 2008, Heru has been lecturing in the postgraduate program of the theology department of Sanata Dharma University. He also has various teaching experiences at the Center for Religious and Cross-Cultural Studies, which is attached to Gajah Mada State University, Yogyakarta. 
Um, since 2013, Heru has also been a member of the advisory body of the Jesuit Superior General for Ecumenical and Inter Interreligious Dialogue. And since 2020, he has been a member of the advisory body of Pope Francis for Christian Muslim Dialogue. So without further, further ado, uh, let us all welcome our speakers, Father Heru and Sleep. Yeah, thank you, Mackie. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, thank you for inviting us to join this conversation. And it's our pleasant, pleasant duty to be here and to share with you all our talk on Jesuit Muslim relations in Indonesia. Before we start this session, here we're gonna show you the overview of our talk. So I'm gonna share my screen. For taking time. Leah, is that clear? It is, it is clear, very clear. All right, this is the overview of our presentations. Jesuit Muslim relations in Indonesia. So this talk will be divided into six parts. First of all, we're gonna give you the introductions or the background to see the fun fact of Indonesia with regard to the growth of religion and then the population. And then we'll continue with talking about dynamics of Islam in Indonesia and then our state of questions. And we'll continue with the society of Jesus and Islam throughout history. And then the dynamics of the Jesuits' presence among the Muslims in Indonesia. And then we will end up with some conclusions and reflections. So this is the overview of our presentations. I'm gonna start with the introduction. This is the background of our country, Indonesia. To begin with, here is the fun fact of this country. According to World Population Review or WRP in 2020, this is the recent uh, data we get, the number of Muslims in Indonesia reached 80% over the entire population. This year, the population of Indonesia is about 127.5 million. So you can just count 80% of the number, 120.5 million people. So Indonesia is the largest Muslim country and one fifth of the Muslims in the world live in this country. And the Christians, meanwhile, are just 9% of the entire population and 4% they get other beliefs, the local beliefs. So with this data, it is necessary for the Christians, not to mention the Indonesian Jesuits to always animate their apostolic imagination in dealing with Muslims. It is necessary for all of us to do this, to deal with the Muslims. There is no more choice. All right, this is the short background of our country that uh, moves us to uh, observe more about the relations of the Jesuits or the Christians and the Muslims. I'm gonna go on to the next part, the dynamics of Islam in Indonesia. The dynamics of Islam regarding its growth in Indonesia can be categorized into three different periods of time, namely, Pre-colonialism period, it's around 12th all the way to 18th century. And then colonialism period from 18th to 20th century. And then post-colonialism period, 20th to 21st century. And let's see how Islam grows so fast in Indonesia during these three periods. First, pre-colonialism period. This period was dominated by the tension mounted from within the body of Islam regarding its mystical beliefs called Sufism between the native Indonesian Sufism 
which later was adopted by early native teachers of Sufism and the doctrinaire Sufism. So there was a tension in this period and Islam had been flourishing, flourishingly expanded and accepted by the people of Indonesia. And the process of Islamization had taken place in many ways of which had been through mysticism teaching. That's the first period, pre-colonialism period. Secondly, we go to the colonialism period. In this period, the growth of Indonesian Islam was stanced by the internal and external forces in terms of social, religious, and political affairs. The arrival of the Dutch colonial government in the 19th century had brought confrontation to local Muslim. Maybe we do not know yet about this, but see that the 19, in the 19th century, the Dutch colonialism had brought confrontation to local Muslim under the influence of culture, science, and then the concept, new concept of growing imperium, the Dutch colonial government in this century, they tried to change their approach and strategy towards Indonesian Muslims. Through this new approach, the colonial government intended to weaken the Islamic influence deemed threatening. Such an approach was known as Orientalism. Here, you can see the picture of this great man. I'm not saying it's great man, but he had great influence back then. So in the period of colonialism, this man, namely Christian Snukhur Gronje, or with the Muslim Islamic name called Mufti Haji Abdul Gawar, he should be named, he should be mentioned because of his influence to the Muslims and the approach of the Dutch government to the local Muslims in Indonesia. All right, so in this period, the confrontation had been starting, confrontation between the Dutch colony, colonials and also the local Muslims. Go to the third period, post-colonialism period. What happened in this period? This period was characterized by the growth of Islam during uh, this period. It was characterized by a tension between Islam with Indonesian perspective and Islam with a transnational perspective. It's kind of like, you wanna be Indonesian Islam or transnational Islam. And later on, the period, in this period, the dynamics of Islam development in Indonesia was marked by the emergence of new pattern in Islamic discourses and practices. And you can see the difference between the first, uh, first uh, period, the second period and the third period. In this third period, the new pattern on Islamic discourses and practices later be became Islamic modernism. So, this emergence was closely related to the development of Islam in the Middle East. During this period, the influence of Christian Snooks Burgroen, the one that I showed you in the uh, previous slide, uh, his influence, his Orientalism legacy were still significantly apparent, albeit his absence in any Indonesian regions. Despite this fact that Orientalism idea had received enormous resistance, as it was mentioned in Edward Said Woods, the title of his book, if I'm not mistaken, is the Orientalism like that. So the Orientalist successors of Snooks Burgroenje still considered that Islam should be empowered as a local culture instead of the Arabic culture. And they also bore the responsibility to prepare Islam against any challenges in the modern world, including their coexistence, uh, coexistence with non-Muslims. This is the short explanations of the three 
different periods of the dynamics of Islam in Indonesia. So you can see that the growth of Islam is dynamic and then the characteristic from one period all the way to today is also different. Next, Father Harry Pragoso is gonna uh, explain to us the state of questions. So from the fun fact of our country and then with the other fact of the dynamics of Islam in this country, then we're gonna pose the state of questions that we're gonna figure out later in our observations or in our surveys. Father Heru, the time is yours. Thank you. So the year 2021 has marked the 50th year of the Society of Jesus committing their services in Indonesia as an independent province, which is later known as the Indonesian province of the Society of Jesus. In spite of being established for only a half century, 50 years, but actually long before the foundation of the Indonesian province of the Society of Jesus, the early Jesuit missionaries had formally stepped their feet in Indonesia. Since 9th of July, 1859, or approximately 163 years ago. And such an extent, however, did not mention the earliest arrival of St. Francis Xavier in Ternate, circa 1546. On this occasion, the Indonesian province of the Society of Jesus has the intention to explore the significant periods of social, historical, and ecclesial concerns that underline not only its background and reputation, but also its character. This may raise some questions. How do the Jesuits in the Indonesian province express their attitudes and make their approaches to Muslims all this time? And how should its dynamics be in the presence of Muslims this far? To deal with those questions, we made the research. What I mean with we, uh, I myself, and then brother uh, CV, and there is actually one more brother from uh, Jakarta. We made the research with a method that may be simply called genealogy. In philosophy and cultural science, the genealogy approach is adopted by tracing the common yet established words, concepts, or discourses. The ultimate goal to which this genealogy approach conveys is a brand new self-awareness, but this does not, is not limited to criticism or interrogations regarding the constructions of key events, but also along the journey of the Jesuits in Indonesia, especially with respect to their dynamic encounters with Muslims. The genealogy method, Hebar, is employed to disclose crucial events depicting the dynamic interaction or encounters between the Jesuits and Muslims in Indonesia by taking into account systematic reflections related to certain Jesuit individuals, including the relevant archives and written documents, as well as oral history from both Jesuits and non-Jesuits. And all this we have, uh, regarding this, we have published a book. Uh, the title is Jesuits and Muslims, the dynamics of the presence of Jesuits uh, in the press in, among the Muslims in Indonesia. We just published it uh, last, last month. I will move to the Society of Jesus and Islam throughout history to give a background uh, how the Society of Jesus deal with Islam in the history. I will mention two points. First, regarding Ignatius. 
Ignatius or Inigo Lopez de Onas de Loyola, born in 1491. He was born in the Basque region north of Spain. Patrick Ryan in the introduction to thoughts of St. Ignatius Loyola for every day of the year, suggests that Basque culturally differs from that of Spain. Nevertheless, the Ignatius Loyola and his family had built a strong bond with the Spanish monarch to reclaim Spain from the Muslims. And the conquest of Granada, 1492, this is one year after Ignatius' birth, became the pinnacle of the long strike. Such a background context of Inigo's history encapsulated in Reconquista inclination. And this definitely affected his early outlook toward Islam and Muslim. Another account of Ignatius' early attitude toward Muslims was also mentioned in the autobiography, which was then widely known as the story of Muldisama. It could probably be the earliest interreligious dialogue opened by an individual of the Society of Jesus with a Muslim. On his way to Montserrat, Inigo met a Moor, a Muslim, on a mule riding like himself. And the Moor said that Mary, the mother of Jesus, could no longer be a virgin upon giving birth to Jesus. Such a remark was no worse than a blasphemy for Ignatius. And so he pondered for a moment before deciding that he was going to do to the more. Before then, they reached a crossroad. Ignatius gave up his conclusion to his mole. Upon seeing that the more took a direct uh, direction, he decided to drop the reins and let the mule choose which path he should follow. Unless his mule took a different path from where the more pressed on, he would chase him and kill him after all. Otherwise, he would likely let him be. But eventually, the mule took a spirit way of the more. And thus, Ignatius decided to set the man, the more, the Muslim, who had previously disgraced the Holy Person Mary, free. And then the second, as in itself, the Ignatian spirituality represents the spirit of a pilgrim, finding God in all things and striving to seek God's will on a daily and ongoing reality, as well as in multiculturalism, being receptive to the revelation of God to other people in their cultures. In this regard, Michael Amalados mentioned three Ignatian perspectives. In accordance with the cosmic perspective of Ignatius, the mission accomplished by Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is implemented in this context. This perspective can be found in the key reflections Namely, for example, the principle and the foundation, or the call of Christ the King, or the contemplation to attain God's love, which flow down through the ultimate salvation of the entire universe and all its history. In accordance with Ignatius' mission to liberate people in their life's choices, a man is supposed to be receptive to their future and yet relieved from their burdening past. According to Roland Mudras in Ignatian Humanism, a dynamic spirituality for the 21st century, the real character of Ignatian spirituality is its humanism, or more precisely, Renaissance humanism, in which accommodation becomes one of the important aspects. In accordance with the teachings of Ignatius in the spiritual exercises, in which the director should only act as the witness of the encounter between God and the retreatants, he is ready for any plausible assistance, but with very little intervention. In other words, 
every person has their call to help others find what God has wanted them to do in independent and creative ways. Through the spiritual exercises, especially the contemplation on the incarnation, we are led to an, to an awareness of a complex reality that God himself is bound to the divine love on which all creations are depending, in such a manner that Christ shall be present to the way of kenosis. In light of the kenosis Christ, or a total self-detachment, the society of Jesus is expecting a firm courage to enter the space and time in relation to the concrete reality as also emphasized in the general congregation 34. Now let us see uh, the dynamics of Jesus' presence among the Muslims in Indonesia. It is the core of the theme or the topic of this conversation this afternoon. So uh, please, Brother TV to continue. Thank you, Father Harold. Here, we go to the main part of our talk. Let's see the dynamics of Jesuits' presence among the Muslims in Indonesia. In general, the Jesuits' relations with Muslims in this country seem to be dynamic. We would argue that there are at least three major character categories depicting the shifts and an advancement of the Jesuits' approach to Muslims. First of all, the first paradigm, which can be formulated like this. Let us walk our path while you follow yours. So in this paradigm, the Jesuits were considering the presence of Islam with an inclination to walk separately in the notion. Uh, let us walk our path while you follow yours. Or there is no relationship between the Jesuits and the Muslim. They walk separately. The Jesuit made a response to the presence of Muslims with the inclinations to walk separately by consider considering them to be the outsiders beyond the Jesuit. Some underlying reasons pertaining to this kind of approach are the Orientalism influence derived from the Dutch colon colonialism era, the traumatic experiences shared by the Jesuit in either their childhood or priesthood, and also the imagined fear, the fear that is only in their imaginations, but not real, they experienced it. Most of the early Jesuit missionaries came from the Netherlands. Back then, Indonesia was also under the colonialism regime of the Dutch, see? So during the colonialism period, just like what I mentioned before, the Dutch East Indies government saw Islam, the religion to which the people had long belonged as potential threats, see? And insisted on its annexation by any possible means, including the act of innervating the root groups in the lower class. Should we trace back, the approach of Islam is standing right there while we are here. Presumably is a byproduct of the colonialist, colonialism influence and the characteristic of the Orientalism view from Western culture. And the colonial government was aware that Islam had brought unity to, to local people and set them apart from uh, foreigners, something like that. And it means that should they let Islam spread its influence over the people, an inevitable danger was likely to happen. Islam could potentially unite the people to spark off rebellions against the Dutch colonial government. There are so many exam examples, but I didn't want to mention right now. A Muslim called Khalis Akbar. There was a Muslim called Khalis Akbar in a website, Hidayatullah. You can just figure out on Google. Asserted that the concept of Orientalism adopted by Dutch missionaries was a means of disseminating Islam, destroying Islam by promoting the wealth of Javanese culture identity. So this is how he accused the Jesuits of the Dutch missionaries. He, in his mind, it could be seen clearly in the approach adopted by, for example, I use the example of Father Franciscus Gregorius Josephus Van Litt, 
the pioneer Jesuit missionary after Francis Xavier. Carrying out in depth observation in the field, Father Van Lid, I'm gonna show you the picture maybe better. Now, this is the, the man. Sorry. I have a picture of Father Van Lid. Yeah. He is the man who uh, tried to uh, emphasize the Japanese culture in the school he established back then. And according to Khalis Akbar, the one who accused him to have a long-term Orientalism uh, agenda, uh, Father Van Lid could be categorized as the one uh, who thought that the Muslims were there and the Christians or we were here. And in addition to his arguments on Father Van Lid, the arguments of Khalis Akbar on the apostolic approach of Father Van Lid, he pointed out a masterpiece by Father, the second person, Father Sud Mulder. I also have the picture of him. Uh, Father Su uh, Khalis Akbar also pointed out a masterpiece by Father Sud Mulder in Indonesia. Uh, that the book or the masterpiece is entitled Manugalin Kaulo Gusti, or Unity Between God and Human Being. In his dissertation that I just mentioned the title, Father Sud Mulder disclosed the core of the divinity view of the Japanese people through careful study on the Japanese mysticism literatures, one of the which is Surat Centini, Centini. And according to Father Sudmulder, Japanese people see the unification between human being and God as the ultimate being through the concept of Manungaling Kaulo Gusti, or the unification between human beings and God. And in the light of concept of Atman Brahman in Hinduism, Father Sudmulder understands that God as the ultimate being over other beings merge himself into the universe because the universe itself is part of the one and absolute being. So Father Sudmulder associated pantheism or all things can be God or monism one, there's only one God with the Sufism traditions of Islam. So this is how he tried to uh, make to encounter these two different cultures, the teaching of Islam and then uh, Japanese culture. And Father, in his works, Father Sudmodo spe specially included a chapter on the view of Islamic mysticism from the ways of the Sufis. In such discussion, Father Sudmodo asserted that there was a syncretism you know, between Islamic teachings and Japanese people's belief. <laughs> regarding Manungalin Kaula Gusti. So that's the second person that uh, Father, uh, that Khalis Akbar accused. All right, so now we move to the third one that can be categorized into the first paradigm. Okay. The next person is Father Dick, yeah. So, this course about suspicious attitude and approach regarding the presence of Islam will always remind us about the controversy over the movement made by Father Big SJ. So this is the controversial uh, Jesuit in the past, but there are so many sources that we just can observe. It's still debatable, but mostly he was accused by the Muslims that he didn't only try to um, fight against communism in the time of Suharto, President Suharto, but also to fight against Islam. That's the accusations that we heard from the observations. However, the people who follow Father Big, who learned from him, who joined his movement of, we call it a 
kind of categorizations like that to uh, train the young people so that they can be courageous to uh, get involved into the politics in Indonesia. And uh, those people said something different about Father Big. According to them, Father Big didn't, he was not anti-Islam. He also made some encounters with the Muslim brothers and sisters. See, and however, we just uh, can put his name, this Jesuit, into the first paradigm because there's so many accusations to him. Even though in our book, you will see that we just provide everything. The, di uh, the dialogue of um, those who are against for the big and those who supported him. Like, so that's the first paradigm. Next. Second paradigm, uh, Father Heru is gonna uh, present this paradigm. So Father Heru, I'll let you to go through. So I would like to uh, continue with the second paradigm. Uh, in, a, in our opinion, it seems to be more inclusive, although it tends to be more in textual approach. Apart from the impression that some Jesuits consider the existence of Islam, with the inclination to walk separately from the perspective, let us walk our path while you follow yours, because of either the Orientalism inherited from the Dutch or their traumatic uh, experiences, certain Jesuits tend to understand the presence of Islam and the Muslims with an inclination to walk together. It should be noted that there are certain Jesuits who have intention to know more about Islam by means of deep research to strictly academic approaches as part of their armchair exercise. The very proper Jesuit to represent this kind of apostolic work, I would mention the name Father Bakker, Jan Bakker. Even though there are also several other Jesuits who undertake their apostolic work in relation to Islam by means of academic approaches, but Father Jan Bakker has shown his distinctive characteristics as an academia who had pursued Islamic studies in strictly textual approaches. In general, Father Jan Bakker's writing have made major contribution to Indonesian people awareness so that they will remain critical and contextual in their attempt to build up a, posit a positive relation between interreligious groups. But the Jan Barker's apostolic words can be perceived as a door to understanding and greeting and greater recognition for other religions and not limited only to Islam. The impression of Father Jan Barker as an armchair um, scholar is undeniable due to the lack of his contacts and existential interaction or encounters with the followers of other religions, more specifically with the Indonesian Muslims. Now I move to the third paradigm. It is the paradigm that can be categorized as more contextual with inclusive inclination through mutual learning and dialogical approach. As such, the courage to flourish coexistence with Muslims by means of mutual learnings derives from the essence of the ecclesial teachings ever since the Second Vatican Council from which the sense of openness towards people of other religions have been shown. Along with the universal and local church, the Jesuits in the Indonesian province express their readiness to live out the inclusive spirituality contained in the church document. In this regard, the Jesuits have shown their Sentire Kun Ecclesia, which means thinking with the church, through several 
several interviews and field observations, we found that several Jesuits who initially felt uncomfortable with certain Muslims and Islamic groups, but due to either traumatic uh, experience or image in fear, they said that finally, they are able to reconsider their individual dispositions as relative occurrences because there are more significant values to uphold and strive for above all resentments and fears of the people of other religions. Yet, does it mean that the strong will to open a dialogue not confirm the church call for evangelism? On this account, we, call, we can call to mind the concept of apostolic dialogue as emphasized by Stephen Bevans and Roger Schroeder. Both theologians reflect on the relations between the gospels and cultures in which both continuity and discontinuity happen to each other at the same time, considering that the values of the gospel are also noticeable in all culture, yet simultaneously there are also some challenges brought by the values of the gospel over all culture. It is notable that according to the ones and Schroeder, mission is mainly and primarily a form of dialogue. David Boss, as a theologian of mission, through his manum opus paradigm shifts in theology of mission, also states that in its progress among various meanings of mission, it seems that mission can be perceived as a testimony told those coming of different religious background. In some, dialogue and mission are the two sides of a coin. Without doubt, the Jesuits in, in Indonesia express their readiness to create unity of mind and heart with the church by showing their openness and willingness to walk together with people coming from various religious backgrounds, including the Muslims. The readiness is clearly manifested in many forms of apostolic works, such as in the formation and intellectual works, social works, education, parochial works, retreat and spirituality, social media, etc. We would like to give some concrete examples regarding the efforts of the Indonesian Jesuits to establish cooperation with people of other religions. First of all, in our formation and intellectual works, we have some programs in every stage of formation, such as peregrination in the novitiate, immersion in the state of philosophy, and academic discussion in the state of theology. Meanwhile, in our social work, such as Jesuit refugee service or Realino Social Center, and many more, we do not only serve the Christians, but also the Muslims. Among other apostolic works, works the Jesuits have been doing, they are known for their works in education. Through these educational works, they try to encourage students to be actively involved in efforts to establish collaboration with people of other religions. With the unique pedagogy and activities provided in educational institutions, they manage. The Jesuits gave their students an offer to embrace the inclusive way. So now we come to the conclusion, and I would like to ask uh, Brother CV to start with some points. Thank you, Father Haru. To conclude this presentation, we would like to say that the Indonesian Jesuits, not to mention the Christians in general, are going through the changing dynamics in the context of space and time. If we are using, in the light of uh, Thomas Kuhn's idea on paradigm shift, we could mention three kinds of paradigms here, namely first, considering 
considering the presence of Islam with an inclination to walk secretly in the notion, let us walk our path while you follow yours, or then the second paradigm, considering the presence of Islam with an inclination to walk together through a textual approach in a unilateral relationship, just like what Father Jean Baker did, and the third paradigm is considering the presence of Islam contextually in inclusive manners with an inclination towards, towards mutual learning through dialogue. So those are three paradigms that we observe in the relations between the Jesuits and the Muslims. So it is important to understand that as mentioned previously, the classifications of these three categories is not historically linear. These three categories are just typologies. See, we can notice, for example, from the life of Father Fanlit, even though he was more focused on the internal words for the local church and did not pay much attention to Muslims, there is, there is clear evidence that he also uh, encountered with Kiai Haji Ahmad Dahlan, the founder of an Islamic organization, Muhammadiyah here. That's the big organization of Islam. Likewise, by all means, we cannot bluntly say as if all the recent Jesuits have a highly enthusiastic spirit to build up positive relationship with Muslims. If we ask one by one in person, the Jesuits in Indonesia, do you, uh, want to uh, make good relationship with the Muslim brothers and sisters? I'm pretty sure, to be honest, not everyone will say yes. So it is also be per perceived that as um, this, map this mapping of the experience and approach adopted by the Indonesian Jesuits regarding the presence among the Muslims can be inferred as an invitation to bring forth synergy to each other. It can also be perceived as the efforts to give meaning to, uh, to the apostolate of, of the society of Jesus. Either positive or traumatic experience, either purely textual, academic, or contextual approaches, all have their existential significance. See, And it should not be perceived as a substitution or a negation on the other. And that is part of the chastity struggle to embody the general vision, the general visions of the Society of Jesus, as stipulated in the GC 36 on reconciliations and justice, or the GC 34 here, GC 34. To be religious today is to be interreligious in the same time, that in the sense that a positive relationship with believers of other faiths is a requirement in a world of religious pluralism. That's what GZ34 says. Through the lens of contextual Christology, the Indonesian Jesuits seem to be ready to hold not uh, merely Jesus the gate, like what uh, the Gospel of John 10, 9, verse 9 mentioned, but also the bridge. I say it again. Not only Jesus the gate, but Jesus the, the bridge. Now, Father, Be Father Heru is going to give us the reflections of our talk. So, Father Heru, the time is yours again, please. Uh, but then, which aspect should the Jesuits in the, in the Indonesian province develop to face the challenges in opening a dialogue with the other? particularly the Muslims. In an interview on the hopes and anxieties of the Catholics, the late Father General Peter Hans Kolpenpa expressed a positive view about Asia. He emphasized that Asian people are known for their remarkable tolerance, not to mention their capability to build up collaboration with other communities. One of the causes is their local wisdom and cultural traditions, 
which are properly maintained. But the General Peter Hans Kolpenbach also has positive impression of Indonesia. He said that as a country with the largest Muslim population in the world, Indonesia is known as the country of high tolerance. It makes sense as it has the supporting components in both social and national settings, especially the Pancasila and the state constitution of 1945. And among all the positive values therein, people will notice that Indonesia is not a religious state, is not an Islamic state, but a state having its foundation on the belief in the Almighty God and upholding religious freedom. The Jesuit dynamic missions among the dynamic Muslims in Indonesia have given certain challenges in terms of external dimensions, such as social, economic, cultural, and so religious issues, but also the eternal dimensions aiming at the integration of personal growth as a person dedicated to the apostolic works. The next question is four parties. And regarding the external dimensions, here are some questions. This is the last point. What should the Jesuit do if the next church leader introduces a new policy which is different from what has been carried out by Pope Francis? What should the Jesuit do if the next Indonesian leader establishes something that are different from what has been worked out by president, our president, uh, Joko Widodo. <laughs> Meanwhile, concerning the internal, internal dimensions, the questions are as follows. How should we perceive, reflect, and communicate our faith in Christ before most of the Indonesian people who do not in fact place their, their faith in Christ. Is it possible for us, for Indonesians, to build a contextual theology with an Indonesian locus theologicus, where plurality and Islam are part of? Is it possible if the Jesuits in their daily apostolates and missions in light of the inaction spirituality especially contemplatio at amorem, find the presence of the Christ among those who do not believe in Christ. And I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father Heru. Thank you, Brother Siwi, for that enlightening talk. Indeed, it is uh, very timely in this uh, Ignatian year of the anniversary of the conversion of St. Ignatius. Uh, to also see you know, the, the many conversions or paradigm shifts uh, we have seen in the uh, relations of Indonesian Jesuits or the Jesuits in Indonesia uh, with the uh, presence of Islam uh, from a, a walking apart from to a textual relationship and then finally to a contextual relationship, all the while being undergirded by a spirituality uh, that allows us to find God in all things, uh, allows us some space. You know, to uh, to encounter the other, someone who is dif someone who is different, uh, and yet the same as us. So thank you again, Father Heru and, and Brother Siri. Uh, now we come to uh, to questions. Now, if there are questions among uh, our participants in this uh, in this talk, we are now opening the floor for them. We have one question currently on queue sent by uh, the chat box. No? So this is for our speakers. How do the Jesuits bring the values of the gospel to the culture of the Islamic youth? At the same time, what are the challenges brought by the values of the gospel to the culture of Islamic youth? I will start to uh, respond to that questions and perhaps Brother Sivi can uh, complement it. For the challenges, I would mention uh, three challenges. The first one at the level of theological uh, view. Is it possible for us 
as I mentioned already in the conclusion, to uh, to bear a theology, a contextual theology, with uh, based on the context that Islam and Muslims uh, are the majority of the people in Indonesia. So, a contextual theology in the sense that uh, based on the context, especially with uh, a plurality. I think this is also corresponds to the triple dialogue as already uh, emphasized in uh, FETC. And the second one, at the level of spirituality. If uh, the Jesuits only, uh, I mean, or Christians in, in general, uh, only 9% uh, before the uh, majority uh, who are Muslims, is it possible for us to find and to discover the presence of Jesus among those Muslims who do not in fact believe in Christ? They accept Jesus as Isa, but not as Christ. And is it possible for us to, 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 to find and to discover his presence among them? And here we can, we can uh, uh, refer to, let us say, for example, uh, Matthew chapter 25, those who are sick, those who are in prison, and so on and so on. Who are the majority of the one in prison in Indonesia? Mostly are Muslim. So there can be also a means for us to discover and to find Jesus in our apostolic work, in our daily life. And then the third one, this is the challenge, is uh, related to the what I call a way how to manifest our faith in our daily work. Is it possible for us to work together, start from the beginning together with, with them? Usually, I just give an example. Usually, let us say, for example, we built a school and then our school is open for anybody. Is it possible, for example, we, we, we start a school uh, together as a, as a consortium with a Muslim and together we work for uh, the bonum uh, for, for the for the better situation in the, in Indonesia and this is not the only this is not an utopia because we we have some examples for example in a in a center in a, in the state university there is a state that uh, there is a center uh, collaboration uh, is built as a collaboration between Isla Islamic University, Christian University, and State University. And uh, 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 these three groups uh, work together to, to give a service in uh, education for the, the common good for the people. So those three challenges uh, I would mention, and this is a challenge for us. Thank you. Me, um, I'm thinking that we need to define again, redefine the meaning of evangelization for this time. In the old days, evangelization could be understood by spreading the values of the gospel to the people and let them to be baptized and join the body, the mother church. But today, we cannot do that again, especially in, in, in Indonesia. Why? Because we're the minority. Among 90, oh, sorry, 87% of the populations. So evangelization in our context should be like this. We keep spreading the values of Christianity in our own way. However, we do not have any intention to baptize them. If they uh, freely from their hearts want to be baptized, thanks be to God. However, if they just want to be themselves, it doesn't matter for us. That's the way we spread the values of the gospels in the context of Muslim country, like in Indonesia. So it's a little um, answer of the, the answer uh, of the questions of Brother Chia. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Um, another question we have on Q is, Father, through three through the three paradigms in your presentation, uh, what are the most important points that in, that can help move forward, and where are the obstacles in the points of dialogue? How about theological dialogue? Okay, uh, I will start with mentioning something that is very unique for for uh, Islam in Indonesia. You know that uh, Indonesia is the only country, I think, which is open for uh, religious freedom, in the sense that for Muslims, they still can uh, can have opportunity to, 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 to convert. Conversion is not the, the main point, but uh, you see that uh, with the majority uh, Muslims in Indonesia, there is still a room for, uh, let us say, following the voice of the conscience to find God. And this is, I think, a unique, uh, something unique in Indonesia. If you go to, for example, uh, countries like in the Middle East or somewhere else where the majority of uh, Muslims are majority, it is almost impossible to convert, to have, uh, to, to follow the the voice of the conscience to, to uh, let us say, to come. So with this uh, situation, I would say that we have a, a large room for, for working together, for uh, building a collaboration. And if you ask me which, which uh, uh, paradigm uh, we will prefer, we will uh, uh, find out the third one. We walk together, we learn each other and we uh, collaborate each other. And what is the problem, the, 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 the obstacle? The obstacle is this, from every community, let us say a Muslim community, even Christian community, any community of the believers, there are always some people who uh, let us say, follow uh, uh, an extremism. And they do not want to have a kind of collaboration among uh, other believers. We see that the problem uh, in Indonesia is for any religious community is the polarization between what I call as puritanism and uh, inculturation. Those who support the idea of puritanism, meaning that uh, if Islam must uh, refer to, to, Arab, for ex to Arab, for example, or Christian to the West, for example, something like that. And the other poll is uh, those who support the idea that we must be inculturated, we must support the cultural values as we found in the society. And I would say that uh, the, the, the inculturated groups from, Indo from Islam can work together easily with uh, those who support the cultural values from the Christian, Christian, uh, Christian communities. But with this group of uh, what I call extremism, uh, especially from the, those who support the idea of puritanism, it is a, it's not easy from, from any uh, aspect. It is not easy. And this is a really an you know, obstacle for us. Thank you. I'm going to add some uh, answers uh, for the questions of Brother Tian Wu. Through three paragraphs in our presentations, what are the most important points? For me, there is only one most important point. It is the desire for from ourselves to uh, get involved, to encounter the people from other religions. And, you know, there are always many obstacles. Father Heru has mentioned some. And even in ourselves, we, we are stuck in our comfort zone. You know what I mean? Um, we do not want to see the Muslim brothers and sisters because we already 
imagine we, we already think of them like oh they're uh, violent uh, they're terrible they're terrorists maybe so those way of thinking are not uh, really helpful for us to uh, to make any efforts into dialogue with the Muslims so uh, how about the theological dialogue sometimes the dialogue doesn't have to uh, doesn't have to be theological. We do not need to talk about theology in our religion and what is the theology in your religion. Yeah, it sometimes happens. I did many times in this theologate with the Muslim brothers and sisters. We talk about our, our religion teachings and theology. However, the most important thing is that the encounter itself, see, the moment we meet one Muslim, for example, it can change our way of thinking about them. So that's uh, my point. Yeah? So we just need to uh, build up our desire to, to meet our brothers and sisters who are Muslims. Thank you so much uh, for the questions again, Brother Tipu. Uh, we have another question. Um, let me just bring it up. Uh, from Furen, Faculty of Theology of St. Robert Bellarmine in Taiwan. Thank you very much for your presentation and analysis of Indonesian Jesuit ways of proceeding in relation to Muslims. Are these Indonesian Jesuit dynamics, paradigms, and typologies representative of Indonesian Catholicism as a whole? Or would it be relevant to discuss how Indonesian Jesuit relations with Muslims are distinct from the attitudes or relations with Muslims by other Indonesian Catholics? Uh, it's not easy uh, question. Yeah? You know that uh, Indonesia, you have uh, the Western part and the Eastern part, okay? And the Western part mostly are uh, Muslims. The majority are Muslims. And that's the, the area where the um, uh, majority of, of the Jesuits were. Whereas in the eastern part of Indonesia, the majority are Christians. And to tell you the truth, there are not many Jesuits working there. Uh, now, I do not know how to answer this question, but I just, you, I just give you some illustration. Sometimes I have the impression for uh, my students coming from the east, eastern part of Indonesia, they have questions like this. What is the use of doing dial? Because they are coming from, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the environment is uh, Christians, Muslims are minority. So what is the, what is the point? And I, uh, many times uh, in the first class, I heard this kind of uh, impression. Yeah. So I will not say that they have uh, let us say close-minded uh, horizons, no. But this is different, different, uh, different way how to how to see the reality. Whereas for us, uh, plurality, especially with the Muslims, is our 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 daily life. I cannot live in a certain sense without uh, encountering with them in in any uh, aspect of life. Yeah, and for those. Uh, for the, the, the Christians from the East, like, like, like Eastern part of Indonesia, for example, they can live by themselves without, uh, without uh, being bothered by, by non-Christians somehow, somehow. Yeah. This is perhaps not true, but uh, you know different contexts. And so uh, if you ask me, is uh, what I present as, uh, what we present as three paradigms can also represent the, the, the picture of the Christians in Indonesia, uh, we have to say that uh, we need to see it uh, contextually also. Yeah. Uh, we cannot just uh, 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 consider it I mean, uh, as a general view. But in general, of course, the, in, under the Pancasila, we, we need to build up our our, our mentality and our openness to the others, but uh, but uh, as a process to, to reach that that uh, that process, 
uh, I mean, to the to that uh, idea, uh, there is a, a different dynamics because of the different context. This is uh, I can I can say, and perhaps uh, Brother Siri has a different opinion. Please. Thank you, Father Harold, for the answer. It's already comprehensive. I just need to. I just want to uh, give some more explanations. You know, uh, brother from Fujian, Taiwan, uh, our observation just focuses on the Jesuit and Muslim relations only. You know, um, but these three paradigms that we found out in our observations could be kind of invitation to the other Indonesian Catholics, just you mentioned in your questions. So yeah, it might be different from their approaches. However, we, we, we are sure that there are some similarities between us and also the other Indonesian Catholics regarding uh, the way to approach our Muslim brothers and sisters. You know what? Because we belong to the same teaching, the same church, both the uh, the Jesuits are part of the Catholic Church. So maybe the way we um, deal with the Muslims, like we figure out into three paradigms throughout the history, could be the same like the other Catholic, uh, Indonesian Catholics, but could be different too, because we get involved into uh, many uh, apostolic works, just like we mentioned in our presentations, but the other Catholic uh, maybe the other um, religious orders, the other priests, they have something different way of uh, dealing with the Muslims. All right, that's what I can add from your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's one last question. Sorry if we can't entertain all the questions. Um, but this is from uh, Dixon T. Wellfield. I hope that I pronounced it correctly. From Micronesia. You have mentioned in the introduction that Muslims modernized Indonesia. Is this a thread, or maybe threat, I'm not sure, to the livelihood of Indonesian culture, let alone Christian Catholic mission? Uh, Brother Dixon from Micronesia. Dixon, you were from Micronesia. Yes. Uh, I get my residents in Micronesia, so uh, Shalom. Uh, and also, actually, Brother Sivi also did uh, his residents in Micronesia. So yeah. we have a little bit uh, situation in, in Micronesia. I did uh, residency there uh, two years, Brother Sivi one year. But here, like this, uh, Indonesia is, is uh, something different in the sense that uh, uh, how how uh, how can I say so plural not only in the sense of religions but also language and cultures and so on and so on uh, but in general modernism is not a problem for us yeah. and you will see the, for example from the Google that the young generation the Indonesian uh, young Indonesian generation they are so familiar with this uh, social media and i think i don't know uh, which number uh, but i think one of the highest number they are so familiar with this and uh, it is a it is a common phenomenon for entering the modernism part of uh, part of which is related to social media with internet and uh, and so on and so on now uh, the problem for us in my opinion, that not all are ready to uh, face the diversity opinions and diversity outlooks uh, offered in the media. So some of them uh, are not ready and then they condemn in the sense that uh, the, the they are not. Uh, they cannot accept those who are different, those which are not different, which is uh, different with, with their view. And then uh, here 
there are some extremist uh, uh, practices that they can do for for uh, for destroying the others. Yeah. Uh, the way, for example, the the, the young generations do like the, the you know following a Western culture, for example. For some, they are not ready and they cannot uh, accept that. Uh, and this is a, this creates a problem. So they, they are not always ready with, with this kind of a new movement or new uh, new technology, especially in relation to media. This is my opinion. Brother C, you can... Uh, when I name Brother Dixon. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I'm just... A uh, excited to see my Velo region back three years ago in Micronesia. Brother Dixon Tuofu, we were together there in Chuk. Uh, we became the campus ministers and teachers at Xavier High School. So I really missed my brother Dixon. I'm not interested in answering your question anyway, but I just want to say hi to you. Uh, brother Dixon, you have this is your question. Uh, you have mentioned in the introduction that Muslim modernize Indonesia. Yeah, and that's true. And the Muslims influence Indonesia in many ways. It, they do not only modernize the country, but also change the uh, influence in any other uh, field. Is this a threat to the livelihood, livelihood of Indonesian culture? Uh, I never consider I never consider it as a, a threat because uh, you know that they're the majority. If we do not have initiative to uh, approach them, that will be uh, a problem for us, for our religion, for our faithful, for our people later. You know, so for me, um, their presence is not a threat to the livelihood of Indonesian culture. We always have the ways to make some dialogues with them. Like what I said before, doesn't have to do with theology, doesn't have to do with interreligious dialogues, but just see them in person. And then uh, we can make friends and have positive and um, good relationship. That's more than enough in the context of Indonesia. And for us, yeah, maybe uh, Brother Dixon, some other people might think that the presence of Muslims can be a threat for the citizens. But with this um, publications of the book, we wanted um, we expected everybody, especially in the Indonesian, to um, see our Muslim brothers and sisters positively as if they're our collaborators, they're our brothers. We want to work and collaborate together with them. So that's what I can give to you. Anyway, thank you again for your questions. If possible, you can just uh, say something in person. I mean, uh, open mic, your mic and also a video. <laughs> it doesn't have to do with that. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Yeah, thank you for, uh, for all your questions and uh, thank you for all the participants. And in the very special way, again, uh, we thank Father Heru and Brother Siwi for, for this enlightening conversation, um, especially in uh, with regards to the history and the uh, paradigms of uh, Jesuit and Muslim relations in Indonesia. Uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to call Ms. Leia again for, <laughs> for an announcement. Yes, uh, so thank you for all being here. We're hoping that you can join us once again in our next Asian conversation. So we'll be showing you a poster. Um, this uh, this conversation will be held on April 6, 2022 on a Wednesday. Um, it will be uh, entitled uh, Ngamdu or Standing Meditation, a popular Catholic devotion in Vietnam to be led by Father Muyen Puyen, SVD, who is a licensed in sacred theology, who is a licensed 
relationship in sacred theology graduate of LST. So we hope that you can all join us once again and probably also invite your friends to also uh, join and be, and be together enriched uh, by this dialogue. So to close our, um, our conversations, I'd like to call on Brother Nat to lead us for the closing prayer. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Loving Father, we give thanks for your countless blessings which you have been showering on us. We are journeying toward your kingdom. We strongly believe that you work mysteriously in bringing human beings together despite of their differences as you send your Son among us to be our savior. We humbly beseech you to send the Holy Spirit to deepen our faith by centering our lives in our Lord Jesus Christ, the savior, and to proclaim the good news to others, but at the same time, help us to embrace the profound theophany of other religions so that the unity is always possible despite diversity. We utter the words of St. Francis of Assisi. Make us a channel of your peace. Please make us a channel of your peace. We make this prayer to Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.